Greetings! This is a video that isn't going to appeal to many people, and again a lot of my videos don't anyway. It's quite a specific repair video covering the Dixel XWeb 500, which is a web server for controlling commercial and industrial air conditioning and refrigeration systems. This one came from an industrial unit a few miles away from here. Originally it was running firmware 1.3.1. I tried upgrading 1.6 and managed to trash it. It turns out you really, really need to follow the upgrade instructions to the letter, including the bit about clearing your browser and your Java caches. I did the browser one, but missed the Java one. As a result, the first half of the update went okay, but when I went to do the second half, the update froze at the 0% mark. After a minute ago, I power cycled the controller to have another go. Unfortunately, one of the first things the XWeb had done was wipe its built-in web server. Once it booted, it just displayed an error loading reboot system message. And trying to web browse to it just resulted in a 404 error, page not found. Can't get to it through serial, USB, web, telnet, SSH, nothing. And without the web service running, you can't get to the firmware update page. It's bricked. This was fortunately a spare, but given that the system it's supposed to control is kind of important, it's good to have a working spare. eBay to the rescue. This was up for sale at a very decent price, just under 200 quid including postage. Look familiar? Of course, it's just an XWeb 500 mounted through a cutout and a big steel box. It appears to be new old stock as it came with the old 1.5 firmware. But the cabinet is in mint condition with no holes drilled in the top plate. So I had another go at the firmware update. This time I cleared both caches and it worked a treat. What if? What if I boot this one up, go to the firmware update page, select my firmware, then just before clicking OK, I swap the network cable to the dead one. If it's got the same IP address, will it work? You're damn right it will. Thanks to this eBay one providing a working web server to use, this one was able to receive the update. That's all it needed to bring it back to life and save what can be quite an expensive unit from the bin. So if you've got one of these knocking around with a knackered firmware, especially with an older knackered firmware, what are the steps? Well, firstly, you need a working unit so that you can use this web interface. Secondly, you'll need one of these little jumper pins. You'll find them on very old computer motherboards and cards, but they'll turn up in all sorts of other devices or you can buy them cheaply enough online. I'm going to use this one because it's got a very handy little tab to pull it in and out. If you start an XWeb 500 one of these jumpers across the JMP1 pins on the back, it'll boot into a special mode with its IP address set to the out-of-the-box default of 192.168.0.150. If you're temporarily using one with a live configuration on it, then you'll need to temporarily renumber it to 192.168.0.150 because both units need to have exactly the same IP address for this recovery method to work. Finally, you'll need an old web browser and an old version of Java to go with it. I'm using Firefox Portable 27 and Java 8U11, which is the last one to support the medium security setting. With the jumper fitted in the faulty unit and the network cable plugged into the working one, switch both units on and wait a few minutes for them to boot up. The faulty one should eventually come up with an emergency startup message. You can see here that it's very difficult to read the display on the faulty one. I'm not sure whether the backlight is faulty or the backlight on the earlier ones was simply not as bright. We'll find out later on. It'll take a while longer for the for the faulty one to start up and come into this recovery mode, but it does get there in the end. Now in the web browser, or oh, I forgot to mention, your laptop also needs an address in the 192.168.0 range, just not .150, anything other than .150. You web browse to 192.168.0.150 and sign in as, a, as your admin account. If it's out of the box, it's just admin and admin. Once you signed in, go to the system update page. And accept the numerous Java prompts that are going to appear. Browse to the update you wish to apply. When I fixed it, I needed the 1.6 update and I wanted the non-NC one because I'm happy to wipe the configuration back to factory defaults. As this unit is already fixed and updated way past that and I'm just demonstrating, I'll reapply the latest update instead. Just before you do that, swap the network cable over to the faulty one. 
Then quickly, before it realises you change the connections over, click open. Eventually it'll reboot and we're back in business with a fully working controller. As long as you're upgrading the pre 2.0 firmware, this may also help you factory reset a controller you don't have the password for without undergo cap in hand to Dixel. Just treat the locked unit as you would this faulty one and push the non NC firmware to it to wipe its config. Now for those who are watching and hoping to see what these units can do, unfortunately I don't know an awful lot about them. I only got involved because we're now renting a site with one and it needed to be set up on our network. I'll give you a quick tour of the screens though and where appropriate I'll show you some screens from a live one. Something to watch out for in the config. The network settings of a DHCP server setting which is on by default. If this unit is on your network, then the built-in DHCP server can cause havoc because it will dole out IP addresses without providing the default gateway to go with it, even if it's entered on here. Any computers that happen to pick up an address from the X-Web instead of your internet router will not have internet access. So if you've got these units on your network and you're getting sporadic internet problems in your computers where sometimes they can access the net and sometimes they can't, check this setting. We got caught out so you don't have to. So here's what's inside them, not an awful lot, there's an ARM processor there, it's an Atmel 8091 RM9200, there's a bit of this 48 LC8M16 A2 I think RAM, which instant, interestingly is upside down on that one compared to this one. There's AT49BV322DT and an ST NAND 01GW3B2BN6 with the crystal WJ LXT 972C. There's very little on the door to board, just a couple of relays. The displays are off the shelf units, just fitted on here. Um, I did measure actually the supply voltage with the backlight on, and it's about 4.04 volts across this one. This one's got about 4.5 volts across it, and it is lit, but it's very dim. And there's a difference between the two backlights. This one is fed through a 9.1 ohm resistor and two zero ohm links. This one just has jumpers, so that may explain the slightly higher voltage on this one. And like I said, it is trying to display, it's just really poor. My transistor tester definitely sees a difference between the two. According to this, the good one is two diodes in parallel. With two different forwarding voltages, one of 2.7 and one of uh, just under a volt. So presumably a diode with a reverse protection diode in inverse parallel with it. The other one, it just sees as just under a 200 ohm resistor. Could be a different design. I think it's just knackered. And possibly has it been overdriven? I mean, this one they both got provision for putting the uh, the dropper resistor in there, but uh, this one's just got to jump it out. Who knows? Anyway, that's pretty much all there is to this thing. Um, you won't see them very often because, well, unless you're a refrigeration engineer or an IT technician called in to uh, to network these things. 
So I um, hope someone's found it use, um, interesting. I um, hope somebody's found a, li a little bit of it useful. If you've got any knackered ones of these that you want to bring back from the dead. Um, thanks for watching. I'll catch you soon.